So these two verses show how the meanings are understood. Now, by following the sound of speech through the process of ear consciousness that shows one thought process by following the sound of speech that means when you hear a, a word through the process of ear consciousness so when you hear the word that is a dog you hear the sound with the process of ear consciousness or ear consciousness thought process arises. So with that ear consciousness you hear the sound. Although the sound is the dark, at that moment what you hear is just an audible object, not the word dark yet. It is just a sound that can be heard. And then by means of the concept conceived by the process in the mind door that subsequently arises. So this shows another thought process. By means of the concept conceived by the process in the mind door. So there arises mind door thought process taking the name as object. So at this stage you hear the word dark. Then meanings are understood. That shows another thought process. So here three thought processes are given. The first is ear consciousness thought process. You hear the sound with that thought process. And then mind or thought process that follows. And with that mind or thought process, you hear the name dark, or you take the name dark as object. And after the name comes, meanings comes. So you know the meaning of the word dark with another thought process. So here, three thought processes are given. So whenever you hear a word, like the word dog with one syllable, first there is the ear consciousness thought process, then mind or thought process, and then understanding the meaning, another mind or thought process. But our teacher said, or the sub-commentary said that there is another thought process, not shown here by name and that is the thought process that takes the past sound as object. So there are four thought processes before you understand what that word means. First there is the sound dark. So you hear the sound dark with the ear consciousness thought process and then as soon as you have heard it, it disappears but your mind takes the sound that has disappeared as object and there is another thought process and that thought process is through mind door and not ear door the real sound you hear with the ear but now it, the sound is gone but you recall the sound actually. So when you recall the sound, it is already past. Since it is past, it does not come through ear consciousness thought process. It comes through mind door. And so it is mind door thought process which takes the past sound as object. So now you have two thought processes. And then another mind or thought process follows. And with that mind or thought process, you uh, take the name concept as concept. That means now you hear the word dark. At the first thought process, what you hear is not the sound dark, but just the sound. 
the something that can be heard. And the second thought process takes that sound as object. Now the third thought process takes the sound dark as object. After that, you know the meaning of the word dark. So that means with another thought process, you know the meaning, you know that a dog means a four-legged animal. What do you say here? A notion of the four-legged furry domestic animal and so on. So only after the fourth thought process do you know that uh, it is a dog, uh, it is an animal like that. So, we think that we understand the meaning of the words, immediately we hear them, right? Now I'm talking to you and I'm saying words one by one, and you listen to the words, and then you know the meaning of the words. So you think that you know the meaning of the word immediately after you hear it. But according to this statement, you need how many types of, or how many kinds of thought processes? At least four, right? And each one of them may arise and disappear for many times, not just one time. The first thought process may arise and disappear many times, and then second thought process many times, third thought process many times, and fourth thought process many times. Uh, only after these thought processes, maybe hundreds of thought processes arise and disappear, do you know the meaning of the word that dog means this animal, uh, uh, this being uh, with four legs and so on. So it is very complicated actually. And this is just uh, the word with one syllable. If there are two syllables in the word, you need two ER consciousness thought processes. Uh, you need two thought processes taking the path. Here, one more thought process is needed. That is, taking two as a whole, the combining the two sounds as a whole. Let's say, woman. Right? So first you hear the sound wu, and then you hear the sound man. So. Uh, you hear the sound wu with one thought process and then you hear the man with another thought process. And then with the third thought process, you combine these two into one unit, woman. So with two syllable words, you need one more thought process, three syllable words, another thought process and so on. So if the word has four syllables or five syllables, how complicated this process of understanding will be, you can imagine. So, even for one syllable word, we need how many kinds of thought processes, four kinds of thought processes to understand the meaning. Uh, with two syllable words, maybe two, two, one, five, six, seven, about. So, <coughs> This is how we understand the meaning of the word. If we do not understand the meaning of the word, then the full thought process will not arise in us. Sometimes we hear the words. Let's say English. English is not my mother tongue. So sometimes I hear an, an English word and I don't understand it. So if I don't understand it, if I don't understand it before, beforehand, then the last understanding thought process will not arise. I just hear the sound. I cannot connect that sound with the meaning that it represents. So only when you have known the meaning of the word before will the fourth thought process arise. Otherwise, it will not arise. The other day, somebody asked me whether all five thought processes must go or whether some people may stop with uh, two or three thought processes. So if we do not understand the meaning of the word, there will be no understanding thought process. And it is said in our books that in order to understand 
the meaning of the word you need two conditions you must hear the word so I must add distinctly so you must hear the word distinctly and then you must have known the meaning of the word beforehand only then do you understand the meaning of the word when it is uttered by somebody that is why sometimes we don't understand because we don't hear the word distinctly and also when it is your mother tongue you can fill in for the words you do not really hear because it is your mother tongue now when we talk among ourselves we do not talk articulately actually we blur right but we understand each other <laughs> because we can fill in but if it is in another language like English for us we cannot because we are not able to fill the gaps simply because it is not our mother tongue so in order to understand the meaning of the word you must hear it distinctly it is number one condition and then you must have known the meaning of it before only then do you understand so only then the fourth thought process or the fifth thought process will arise so it is a very complicated uh, process to understand the meaning of the words and uh, you think that you know the meaning immediately after you hear the word right so that means your mind works so very fast that even though there are hundreds of thought processes going on until you know the meaning of the word you don't seem to be going through them because your mind works so fast now as you know there can be billions of thought moments in a second and so when you hear the word dark it may be about f half of the second so during that time many thought moments can come and go and so there are many thought processes you have to go through before you know the word and these concepts should be understood as fashioned by worldly convention now that means people have agreed to call say the four-legged animal described as furry and so on as a dog so when they have agreed that let us call it a dog then everybody accept it then it becomes a dog <laughs> then later when the, we hear the word dog we understand it so that is actually the worldly convention or it is created by convention of people we don't know why this animal is called a dog it might as well be called another by another name so if they decided if the people at the beginning of the world decided that oh let us call it not a dog but by some other name then we will be calling that animal with another name so these are just uh, sounds or names to represent the things and what we call a person a man or a woman a house a cart and so on are all concepts because they are not ultimate realities the ultimate reality is just the uh, the mind and matter um, for living beings and just uh, matter for non living things so in the ultimate analysis we cannot find a man or a woman or whatever but only mind and matter or the five aggregates now even mind or matter is a concept the name mind or matter is a concept but its meaning is real now there is a difference with regard to the unreal according to ultimate reality there can be name concept and thing concept but with regard to ultimate realities there is only a name concept 
but not thing concept, but thing that is real. So let us say feeling. The word feeling is a name concept. But feeling is an ultimate reality and so the feeling is not a thing concept or meaning concept, but it is an ultimate reality. It is not a concept. But with things that are not ultimate reality, we can have th uh, these two things, name concept and meaning concept. Similarly, when seeing something, although it is not mentioned here, when we see something, first we see the visible object and then we see the past visible object with mind or thought process. And then there is the stage of synthesis. They collect the different parts of the thing together and as a whole. And then we see the concept. And then we get the name of that concept. So here, the name concept, the thought process, and meaning concept thought process are reversed. When you hear a word, name concept comes first and then meaning concepts later. But when you see something, meaning concepts comes first and then name concepts come later. You see a man. At first you see the visible object in that man, not yet man at that moment. And then with another mind or thought process, you take the past visible object as object. And then you take the, the combination of all these parts in the body and you take as a whole. And then you see the man, man as a concept. And then the word man comes to you. So name concept comes last. And that name concept will come to you only when you know the name of that thing. Sometimes we see things and we don't know the name of the thing. Then that name concept, will, thought process will not arise in us. Just as when we don't know the meaning, that there can be no understanding of the word. So seeing, hearing and all other activities, although they seem to be very simple, when viewed from the viewpoint of Abhidhamma, they are very complex experiences. So complex that we cannot explain them fully actually. You know, what I have presented to you is not a full picture. <laughs> it is just a simplified picture of uh, what hearing or seeing is. And our teachers have told us that there are many more thought processes involved in this. You already know the meaning of the word and then you connect this meaning to the object now you are seeing and there is a connecting thought process also and then you come to the decision that this is it and then decision thought process also and so there are many thought processes but they are too much for us and so we should satisfied with just what is mentioned here and just a little more. So in these two verses only three thought processes are given but the sub-commentary adds one more thought process and so there are four thought processes here when you hear something and similarly when you see something uh, there are four thought processes following the seeing thought process. So when I say you see a man with your mind you don't see the man with your eyes what would you say? Now you are seeing me and I am seeing you, <laughs> right? So do I see you with my eyes or with my mind? Actually with my mind. <laughs> what I see you uh, is the visible object in you, the visible data. And then in my mind, I collect all the visible data into a shape of a man and say, 
I think I see a man so actually what we see is really misleading <laughs> so we see with our minds and not with our eyes so what we see with our eyes is the visible object what we hear with our ears is the audible object now when you listen to a song uh, a music beautiful music you like it but what you hear with your ear is just a sound just audible object not the sound a tone or melody of the sound then you combine these sounds in your mind into a series and then you say uh, this is a good song uh, and beautiful I like it or something like that so the activities that seem to be very simple are really very complex and it is very difficult to understand or to know uh, these processes going on in our mind and it was the super wisdom of the Buddha that discovered all these and then uh, taught them to the world and so following the teachings of the Buddha and following the teachings of our elders we understand a little but this just little we are proud of ourselves <laughs> so now we come to the end of the uh, eighth chapter the chapter on conditionality and this chapter is divided into two parts uh, dependent origination and the Patana, the modes of relationship and at the end the section on the uh, Panyati or concepts is given now with Nirvana there is one thing I did not uh, explain when we were in the seventh chapter Nirvana is outside the aggregates Nirvana is not among the aggregates If you want to read the book, please go to 290. As Nibbana lacks differentiation such as past, present, future, etc. So there should be etc. It is excluded from the category of aggregates. So Nibbana is not among the aggregates. Nibbana is outside the aggregates. So, so Nibbana is not Ruba aggregate, not uh, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana, Aggregate it is different from or separate from Aggregate why is Nibbana not included in the category of Aggregates because Nibbana lacks differentiation Nibbana lacks division into past, present, future internal, external gross, subtle, far, near and so on so Nibbana is not present, not past, not future. It is called timeless. So there is no time in Nibbana. And Nibbana is always external. There is no internal Nibbana. So it cannot be divided into two external Nibbana and internal Nibbana. Nibbana is always external. And Nibbana is always subtle and never grows. Nibbana is always far and never near. Since Nibbana lacks this division into past, present, future and so on, it is not included in the category of aggregates. So we include in the category of aggregates only those that have this division into past, present, future and so on. So that one thing I did not explain during the seventh chapter. So now we come to the end of the eighth chapter and I think we can go a little into ninth chapter. So the ninth chapter is a chapter on meditation. In Pali it is called Kamathana Sangaha. So the others said that he will explain 
in order the two types of meditation subjects for the respective development of calm and insight. So first, uh, we must understand the term kamatthana. Kama means work. Now here, kama does not mean kama. Kama means work, and thana means place. So kamatthana means work place, a place for work. Yeah, work here means meditation. And there are two kinds of meditation taught in Buddhism. Calm and insight. Or in Pali, Samatha and Vipassana. And of the two, the development of insight is the distinctively Buddhistic form of meditation. That means Vipassana is taught only in Buddhism. So you can find Vipassana only in Buddhism and in no other teachings. This system of meditation is unique to the Buddha's teaching and is intended to generate direct personal realization of the truths discovered and enunciated by the Buddha. Now, Vipassana meditation is not common to other teachings and it helps you to penetrate into the nature of things. It helps you to see the true nature of things. It helps you to see that mind and matter are impermanent, they are suffering and they are non-soul. And then that will lead you ultimately to the attainment of enlightenment. The development of calm is also found in non-Buddhist schools of meditation. Calm meditation or Samatha meditation is taught in other uh, religions also. So Samatha meditation is not taught in Buddhism only, but it is taught in other teachings as well. But in Buddhism, Samatha meditation is for Vipassana meditation. Now, Buddha meant Samatha meditation to be a basis for Vipassana meditation. So Buddha taught Samatha meditation not just for Samatha's sake. Actually, Buddha wants his disciples to practice Samatha meditation so that they can base the Vipassana meditation on uh, what they gained through Samatha meditation. So according to the Buddha's wishes, Samatha meditation must always lead to Vipassana meditation. Now, the word Samatha means quiet, quietness or calmness, quietness of mind or calmness of mind. And it is synonymous with the word Samadhi. In some discourses, the word Samatha means just Samadhi and not in its technical sense as a distinct method of meditation. So, Samatha can mean a distinct method of meditation called calm meditation and also it can mean just concentration, samadhi. And samatha meditation can lead to the attainment of jhanas and also of abhinyas. Abhinyas are a special form of jhanas. But through the attainment of abhinya, one can remember one's past lives, one can know the mind of others, one can see beings dying from one life and being reborn in another, one can hear sounds far away, or one can perform miracles like flying through the air or walking on the uh, water and so on. So, Samatha meditation by itself cannot lead to attainment of enlightenment. It can lead to 
the attainment of jhanas and abhinyas only. That is why for the disciples of the Buddha whose aim is to get out of suffering samatha is not sufficient, samatha is not enough. So even if one practices samatha one must ultimately practice vipassana meditation. So vipassana meditation can lead us to understand the true nature of things and ultimately uh, it leads to attainment of enlightenment or the cessation of all suffering. Now the word vipassana is made up of two parts vi and pasana. So vi means many or uh, many ways or in different ways and pasana means seeing. So vipassana means seeing in many ways, seeing in uh, different ways. And seeing in different ways means seeing the mind and matter or the five aggregates in terms of the three characteristics, namely impermanence, suffering and non-self. So the function of vipassana is seeing the three characteristics, seeing the mental and material phenomena as impermanent suffering and non-self. And this seeing the three characteristics will lead a yogi to uh, the attainment of enlightenment. The attainment of enlightenment is the outcome or the result of the practice of vipassana meditation. And both samatha meditation and vipassana meditation are explained in the book called Visuddhimagga. So if you want to understand meditation in all its aspects, Visuddhimagga is the book to read. And this chapter, the ninth chapter, is like a summary to the entire Visuddhimagga. So this is the brief form of Visuddhimagga. But it is very, very brief. This chapter contains maybe about five or six pages. But Visuddhimagga, in its English translation, more than 800 pages. <laughs> and the translation is not so easy to understand because of the language as well as the subject matter. Uh, Visuddhimagga is a book written by a monk for monks. So he took for granted that his readers already understand Abhidhamma. <laughs> Many Abhidhamma topics are mentioned but they will not be explained in detail. So you can test your knowledge of Abhidhamma by picking up Visuddhi Magga and read one passage. Now you will understand more. Now if you have read Visuddhi Magga before, please pick it up again and read the same passage that you thought you did not understand. So after you have gained a, a knowledge of Abhidhamma, you will understand more of Visuddhi Magga. So, so Visuddhi Magga is actually a handbook for meditating monks. But I say meditating monks because it is written in Pali language and so it is for monks. But since now it is in English translation and also it translation in other languages, it can be read by both monks and lay persons. So now we begin with the Samatha meditation. So Samatha meditation here is explained in seven sections. So the first one is ten casinas and then number two ten kinds of foulness, number three ten recollections, number four 
four illimitables, five one perception, six one analysis, and seven four material states. So these are the subjects of Samatha meditation. If you add them all up, 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 4, 1, 1, 4, how many do you get? 40. So we say there are 40 subjects of Samatha meditation. So you can practice any one of them. You have a choice here. And these seven categories will be explained in a little detail. And then there are what are called temperaments. We should understand temperaments so that we can choose a subject of meditation that is most suitable for our temperament. Temperament means personal nature the character of a person as revealed by his or her natural attitudes and conduct. So we can guess a person's temperament by his conduct, by his behavior, by his way of doing things, and by his way of talking and so on. And temperaments of people differ owing to the diversity of their past karmas. So depending on their past karmas, people who are born here uh, may have temperament of lust or temperament of uh, ill will or uh, uh, anger and so on. So there are said to be six temperaments and they are number one the lustful temperament or lust or loba attachment. Number two hateful temperament. Now you may have met persons who get angry very easily. So those persons have the hateful temperament. And then the deluded temperament. A dull person and he, he cannot come to conclusion either one way or the other, something like that. And the fourth is the faithful. A person who has much faith is called, has the temperament of faith. And number five is the intellectual. That means he, he is a bright, smart, and possess knowledge and six the discursive thinking so these are the six temperaments and people have these temperaments actually it is very difficult to say what temperament a person has even I don't know what temperament I have <laughs> And then, later on, the other will tell us what subject of Samatha meditation is suitable for uh, people of what temperament. Now the next category is development, that is the work of meditation. So there are three stages of mental development. Preliminary development, excess development, and absorption development. So, preliminary meditation occurs from the time one begins the practice of meditation up to the time the five hindrances are suppressed and the counterpart sign emerges. Now, you may not know counterpart sign yet, but later that you will understand. So preliminary development is the development until some time when the five hindrances are suppressed. That means when your mind can be on the object of meditation and your mind is not tormented by what are called the five hindrances, sensual desire, ill will and so on. Uh, you know the five hindrances. And then access development occurs when the five hindrances become suppressed and the counterpart sign emerges. Signs will be given later. It endures from the moment the counterpart sign arises up to the change of lineage theta in the cognitive process culminating in jhana. 
The change that, that immediately follows change of lineage is called absorption. This marks the beginning of absorption development, which occurs at the level of the fine material sphere jhanas or the immaterial sphere jhanas. So there are three stages of development, preliminary development, and then access development or neighborhood development and the absorption development. And then there are three signs. Three signs are preliminary sign, the learning sign, and the counterpart sign. This may mean not much to you right now, <laughs> but please try to remember uh, these signs. The preliminary sign is the original object of concentration used during the preliminary stage of practice. So in the beginning, you use one object as a object of meditation. And during the preliminary stage, the sign is also called preliminary sign. The learning sign is a mental replica of the object perceived in the mind exactly as it appears to the physical eyes. Now when you practice Casina meditation, first you look at the casina, the disc, and then you actually memorize the disc, looking at it, and then closing your eyes, again looking, closing, and so on. In this way, you memorize the disc, and when, when you have memorized and you can see the disc in your mind without looking at the disc, then you are said to have gained the learning sign. And then you dwell on that learning sign again and again and it changes into what is called the counterpart sign. So counterpart sign is much better than the learning sign. So these are the signs a yogi will experience or encounter in his uh, practice of meditation. And then 40 subjects of Kamathan uh, meditation in detail. Now, there are ten casinas, and they are Ad Casina, Water Casina, Fire Casina, Air Casina, Blue Casina, Yellow Casina, Red Casina, the White Casina, the Space Casina, and the Light Casina. Now, what is Casina? Casina means whole or total, all. That means you look at the casino as mostly in the form of a, of a disc. So when you look at the disc and memorize the disc, your mind should take the whole of the disc, not just part of the disc. So that is why it is called casino. The totality of the disc you take as object. And there are ten kinds of casinos. The first one is earth casina that you have to make if you want to practice earth casina first you have to make that casina you find the clay with the color of dawn that means some red clay uh, first you need to have a frame and then it, there should be a piece of cloth or canvas on it and then you put the earth on the cloth in a circle about maybe 10 inches in diameter and after making it you put it in front of yourself and then look at it and practice meditation saying earth, 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 earth thousands and thousands of times that is you are memorizing that earth disk if you want to develop water casino then you can take a vessel full of clear water and then contemplate on it as water, 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 and so on. Then, fire casino, you look at fire and view it through a hole in the piece of leather or a piece of cloth and saying fire, 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 fire. And if you want to practice air casino, then you concentrate on the wind that enters through a window or an opening in the wall saying air, air, air. 
and then there are color casinos. You make a, a disc of uh, these four colors. The first one is blue, and second yellow, red, white. So uh, you may take a piece of cloth or something, or a card, and then you draw a circle. And if it is to be blue casino, then you color it blue. Uh, if it is to be yellow casino, you color it yellow, red, you color it red and white, you just leave it. And then you keep your mind totally on the disc and say blue, 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 yellow, 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 and so on. Now the word blue or nila in Pali is translated in our country as brown. But outside our country it is translated as blue. Now the color of hair is said to be nila. So the color of hair is not blue. It may be black or brown or something like that. But there is one lotus called blue lotus and the color is really blue. So in Bali it is called nila upla, blue lotus. So blue may be also correct. And what color do you see on the Buddhist flag? The first color is blue, right? Yeah. So whether it is blue or brown, it doesn't matter. But what is important is you make that color disc and then you keep your mind totally on that disc and say blue, 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 yellow, 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 and so on. And then light casino may be developed by concentrating on the moon or on an unflickering lamp light. So it is more practical to take the unflickering lamp light than the moon because you cannot get to see the moon every night <laughs> or on a circle of light cast on the ground or on a beam of sunlight or moonlight entering through a wall crevice or hole and cast on a wall and the space casino you develop by concentrating on a hole about 30 centimeters in diameter how big is the 30 centimeter? about a foot yeah, but you need not be exact <laughs> and contemplating on a space, 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 and so on. So these are called casina meditation. On them is called casina meditation. So you can choose f uh, any one of the casinas from these ten casinas: earth casina, water casina, and so on. The next is foulness meditation or foulness subjects. And they are actually the different stages of a dead body. Ten kinds of foulness are a bloated corpse. So after three or four days, a corpse becomes bloated and then livid corpse, a festering corpse, a dismembered corpse, an eaten corpse, and a scattered in pieces corpse, a mutilated and scattered in pieces corpse, a bloody corpse, a worm infested corpse, and a skeleton. You don't want to see any of them. <laughs> huh? And now it is, it is very difficult to practice this foulness meditation because you do not get to see a bloated corpse like, uh, and others anywhere. Even at the cemeteries you don't see a bloated corpse now. Cemeteries are so made that it's like a park. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always say you don't get the notion of foulness even if you go to a cemetery nowadays. So they are made to look uh, pleasant and uh, good places to visit. But in the days of the Buddha, in the olden days, the cemeteries are really foul places. 
and people are afraid to go to the cemeteries. And the dead bodies are just left at the cemetery for the jackals and others to eat. So there may be burying also and also just leaving the dead body in the cemetery. So in those days, all of these can be viewed at some of the cemeteries, but it is very difficult to get those nowadays. But if you want to, you can get a picture of some of them and practice this meditation on it. Uh, This meditation is a powerful meditation for removing sensual lust. If you have too much attachment to your body or to the body of another person, practice this foulness meditation. And in the Mahasadipatana Soda, this meditation is not just look at the bloated corpse and so on and saying they are foul, they are foul, but also applying that uh, nature of foulness to your own uh, living body. Just as this dead body is foul, is disgusting, so is my living body and so on. So by practicing this meditation, you can remove sensual lust, you can remove attachment to your body and so on. And then the recollections. These are very pleasant subjects of meditation and many of you have been practicing this. Buddha Nosati, the recollection of the Buddha. Recollection of the Buddha means recollection of the attributes or virtues of the Buddha. Recollection of the good qualities of the Buddha. And recollection of the Dhamma means again recollection of the virtues of Dhamma and recollection of the Sangha, the same thing. Recollection of morality, that means you keep your sila pure and then you recollect on your purity of sila. I have kept my sila pure and it is not broken in any place, it is not torn, something like that. So keeping the moral precepts pure and then recollecting on it, uh, you gain happiness. And then recollection of generosity, uh, you do some generous act, say dana and so on, and then you recollect on it and be happy. And uh, recollection of the devas mean actually recollection of yourself. The deities are born in such exalted states on account of their faith, morality, learning, generosity and wisdom. I too possess these same qualities. So actually you concentrate on your own qualities but uh, making the qualities of the deities as an example. So this is one of the mindfulness meditation but you recollect or you think of uh, your qualities like morality, learning, generosity and wisdom with the devas standing as witness. That means taking devas as example. And then recollection of peace means contemplation on the peaceful attributes of Nibbana. You are not seeing Nibbana direct but you are recollecting on the peacefulness of Nibbana. Nibbana is good, Nibbana is peaceful, peaceful, something like that. And then recollection of death is also a powerful meditation. Contemplation of the fact that one's own death is absolutely certain, that the arrival of death is utterly uncertain. So we know death is certain, death will come but we do not know when it will come. And that when death comes, one must relinquish everything. So when death comes, we will have to leave everything behind. We cannot take anything with us. And so uh, the fact that death is certain and death will come to us, we recollect that way. Now, recollection of death 
can make us not afraid of death it is very strange thinking of death will make you not afraid of death because say death will come death will come and so you become familiar with death and so you, you are no longer afraid of death so if you are afraid of death try the practice of this meditation recollection of death and then mindfulness occupied with the body is taking the 32 parts in the body and see them as repulsive see them as loathsome now there are 32 parts like hairs of the head hairs of the body nails teeth skin flesh sinews bones marrows and so on now these 32 parts are taught for practice of meditation and not for anatomical lessons so they, <laughs> they may not correspond with or what is taught in anatomy but still the purpose here is to get rid of attachment to one's body by seeing them as filthy and so on now hairs of the head are filthy so this is very evident hairs of the body are filthy nails, teeth and skin because when they are on our bodies we think that they are beautiful we don't think them as filthy but once they are removed from our bodies then they become filthy now if there is a hair in your meal you would throw the, the, the whole meal away <laughs> and then mindfulness of breathing it is very familiar to many people it is the concentrating on the breathing in and out keeping your mind at the tip of the nose or at the entrance of the nostrils or on your upper lip and you may feel a sensation there and you can concentrate on that sensation also so that is a mindfulness of breathing meditation so these are the ten recollection meditations so recollection of Buddha's attributes and so on okay Mita and others will do tomorrow now some t questions here what are the things we should be mindful of when we do chanting for it to be effective and proper now when we chant it is said that we must chant it correctly and we must know the meaning of what we chant uh, these are the requirements on the part of those who do the chanting first learn the chanting correctly and then understand the meaning of the chant and then have loving kindness and compassion for all beings are thoughts objects or consciousness thoughts are objects and thoughts are consciousness both so one consciousness can be the object of another consciousness and what we call thoughts are the combination of consciousnesses so it is both object and consciousness is awareness of thoughts part of the practice of vipassana yes as everything happens due to their respective causes how significant are dreams can dreams help in our spiritual development in buddhism there is not much saying about dreams although their dreams are said to be experienced by people in different ways I have read that some highly developed yogis can cause some people to make certain decisions in a particular way that is they are able to manipulate other people's thought processes if this is true how can this be explained I'm not sure uh, that one person can manipulate the other person's thought process but there is what is called hypnotism and it is something like 
manipulating the other people's thought process. So it may be possible if this is true, how can this be explained? By his maybe mental power, but a hypnotist uses a suggestion. So by his suggestion, the other person actually hypnotized himself. Not that the hypnotist hypnotized the, the other person. So he just gives suggestions and the person hypnotized himself. So, I think by the power of samadhi, it may be possible to influence other people's thoughts. But I'm not sure about this. This is a question from yesterday. How can we teach Dhamma to these two groups of people? Is there any skillful means by which we can use to lead them to the path of Dhamma? These two groups are people who have little interest in listening to Dhamma. <laughs> two people who have no interest at all in Dhamma. <laughs> These two groups have something in common. They would not want to attend any Dhamma classes, Dhamma talks and read Dhamma books. It would be difficult to force another person to what you want to do. Only, I think, only by suggestions can you persuade another person to want to do something. Instead of giving him the book and read and saying to him, read it, you may talk to him like uh, you read a book and it, it is good and it helps you in some of your problems and so on. And then maybe put a suggestion, if you want to read, you can borrow it from me or something like that. So the practice of meditation is also like that. If you tell a person point blank, practice meditation, come with us to practice meditation, then he may not want to practice because there's a resistance in him. But if you persuade him subtly, he might get interested in it. So not by forcing uh, them, but by giving hints to them or s suggesting them and persuasively talking to them, you may be able to bring them to attend the Dhamma courses and Dhamma talks and read Dhamma books. <coughs> I've been practicing Samatha meditation for about three years. How come I am easily <laughs> agitated? Is there any problem with my practice? Uh, that means because you do not get real good concentration. <laughs> so, you practice uh, Samatha meditation, uh, if you get real good concentration, your mind will become calm, because it is called calm meditation. Then when you are calm, you will not be easily agitated. So, Make more effort to gain a better concentration than you already have. I think it can help you to uh, keep yourself uh, more calm. Okay, thank you.